and Tennessee Watson, <clears throat> who is Wildfile State News and Investigations Editor. Uh, she was a 2020 Neiman Abrams Fellow for Local Investigative Journalism, and before that, Wyoming Public Radio's Education Reporter. She loves running with her dogs, Murray and Freddie, dance parties, and pineapple on pizza. Which Scott does not approve of. He told me in an email. All right. So I'm going to talk to you about my project, Wage Working. And this April is actually the 10th anniversary of starting work on this project um, with my collaborator, Laura Haddon. Um, we interview people about what they do and their relationship to their work. And we archive those stories. I'm going to do box over there as well. Um, and we love jukeboxes because they are a collective experience. One person puts money in and then everybody gets to hear the song. Um, and the more money you put in, the longer the party goes. So it's just like a nice symbol. Um, we were inspired by, I'm trying to figure out the timing here. Um, and I'm slightly worried this is not going. Mm. All right. Well. I did like a URL situation instead of a regular slideshow. See. Oh God. All right. Well, I'll adjust it. So we were inspired by Studs Terkel um, and his book Working. He interviewed over a hundred people. All right. Now we're out of sync. Okay. He interviewed over a hundred people from a book binder to a sex worker. And that book came out in 1974, kind of right on the precipice of a lot of change because of new technology and also Nixon era deregulation. Um, and there are types of work captured in this book that don't exist anymore, like switchboard operators, for example. Uh, he interviews a woman named Frances. Her job doesn't exist. She actually would move the cables to connect phone calls. Um, so we were deeply inspired by his work and instead of printing it, because my collaborator and I were both really into audio, we decided to do a slightly different version of that. Um, so we do interviews with people and then we edit them down into excerpts that correspond with the length of time that it takes them to make a dollar. Make this move. So... There's a really cool inverse relationship. The more that you make, the less time you get to talk. And the more, uh, and then the less you make, the more time you talk, um, which I just, I love that, you know, there's some justice inside that tiny box over there. Um, and I feel, I'm, I'm sorry guys, I'm like, because this isn't playing, it's be shoveling. Um, so we were living, we were living in New York City at the time. We got a grant from, through the National Endowment of the Arts, and we did an artist residency in the Hudson Valley, which is a couple hours north of New York City. Um, we put this flyer up asking for people to talk to us about their jobs in gas stations and laundry mats. Um, it's pretty old school with the pull tab. But we also tried to research the economy of the Hudson Valley and like and really strategically do outreach to people that represented that. And then also like kind of more um, unique work too, like a forester and a guy that makes his own skateboards. So it was kind of all over the place. Um, and we really tried as hard as we could in the course of a month to reflect this community. Um, and get to know it through those stories. So this is our first big jukebox where those stories lived. Um, and I recently came across a quote in Eric Baker. There was an essay in Harper's that talked about, in a sense, work functions as a nation within a nation, an imagined community, and its moral health is of obscure but paramount importance. And I think one of the things that Laura and I reflected on is that for whatever reason, it can be uncomfortable to talk about wage. Um, 
I was thinking about it this morning, like, would I ask my boss how much money he makes? I think I should be able to ask that question, but for a whole host of reasons, it's awkward. So this jukebox was the way that we kind of try to get into that obscure community. And no one ever knows the person's exact wage. You only would discover it if you listen to multiple stories. And then you get a sense of like the spectrum of who makes more and who makes less. So it's sort of naming it, but there's also a little ambiguity to hide behind. Um, that's my dad helping me move the jukebox. I don't think it'd be right to talk about labor and work without recognizing all of the help um, and all the hands that made this possible. Um, and moving this thing around was quite difficult. Um, but we do really like the way that the jukebox helps to inspire conversations about the value of work, whose work is valued, how we value our own work, as well as wage disparity. And just like at the bar or the diner, where you would kind of stand around the jukebox, it can bring community together. Um, people don't always listen to all the stories because some of them are very long, um, but the concept itself will get people in the same space talking. So there's also table-sized jukeboxes, like the little one over there we discovered. Um, if you've never seen the jukebox in its natural environment, here's a couple of examples of it. Um, and we were, you know, it's just there with the hot sauce and the sugar packets. And um, so we were able to secure one of these smaller ones that we could move around a little bit more easy. And then we were able to really take this project on tour. Um, this picture is actually from a bar that Aubrey worked at oh, in yeah. Brooklyn. Um, so after the Hudson Valley with a smaller jukebox, we did the project in Brooklyn, New York, um, in Portland, Oregon. Um, we've also done it where as a community-based media project where people want to tell the story of their own community. So we loan them the jukebox, we teach them how to do the interviews, how to cut the tape, and then they fill it themselves. Um, so we've done that in Portland, Oregon. In the Hudson Valley, I'm just gonna talk about a couple favorite uh, folks in different places. So one of the major drivers of the economy in the Hudson Valley uh, are prisons. So we went to the Green Correctional Facility. Getting in there is probably one of the hardest things I've ever done as a journalist. Um, and we spent the day with three incarcerated people who were on the recycling and garbage crew. And their track in the jukebox is 52 minutes long. And it takes three incarcerated people at the time to take them 52 minutes to make $1 because they're paid 37 cents an hour. We weren't allowed to take their picture either. So um, then in Brooklyn, this is Mercedes. She sells a toli and tamales on the street. And her story over the span of time in Brooklyn, I think is really reflective. She came to the United States. She worked in a sweatshop sewing in Brooklyn. Then her job was offshored, so she lost her job. She started selling breakfast to workers in the remaining factories, and that's how she made her living for another 15 years. And then those factories turned into luxury condos, and hipsters don't buy her tamales. So her track is probably the second longest to the inmates in the jukebox. In the jukebox. Um, this is Jackson. Jackson is a birth and death doula in Portland, Oregon. Um, and they say that they really specialize in helping people in transitions and liminal spaces. Um, and sort of in our interview, talking about part of that gift comes from being non-binary. So living in the in-between. And there's some expertise in that that helps people that are also in those liminal spaces. Um, Jackson is also an on-call worker. So in talking to people, 
that's another thing. It's like, how does, when you do your job, how you do your job impact the way that you participate in the rest of society. So now we get to Laramie. Um, where I decided to focus on how workers feel about the power of their voice at work. And there is something about that inverse relationship for those that make the least get to talk the longest that really felt right. It was sort of this like moment where things um, came in sync in a brand new way 10 years after starting it. So this is Logan Hurd, a barber and cosmetologist. Um, and also a student, he told me that he basically is his own boss, but um, that there's also a landlord tenant situation. He rents the chair. So there are other people that are tenants that are renting chairs and they have to work collaboratively. So there's this balance between being totally independent and his own boss, and then also having to work with other folks. And he talked about how that teamwork is inherently democratic. This is Aaliyah Howard, Spanish teacher at Laramie High School. Um, first, she talked about tenure and how it takes three years for public school teachers to get tenure. And that in that those first three years, it can be really precarious because um, she said that her job is not protected. But then I asked her if when she gets tenure, you know, that if she'll feel totally free to speak out. Um, and she said that as a queer woman of color, that no that there's a part of her that's always going to think about the possibility of being harmed or killed for speaking out um, and protecting her students. This is Ana Castro, photographer, ceramicist. She took a lot of the portraits of folks in Laramie. Um, and we talked a lot about what it's like to speak up in the workplace when you're undocumented. Um, and after years of working, for someone else in the service industry where she felt like her immigration status was held over her head um, and where she felt like she, it was unsafe to speak out. She left um, that work last year and now works for herself. Um, and there's still some precarity and anxiety there, but um, we talked a lot about that shifting sense of power and agency. This is Hunter Bullard. Um, who works at Good Vibes Garage. Um, and we talked a lot about helping people. And I thought it was a really interesting conversation. Um, Hunter shared that as a little kid, there was this idea that to make change and help people, that meant being a doctor or a lawyer. And then coming to this realization that especially in a place like Wyoming, where transportation is so important, that's part of how people get to work, that you can actually make a great deal of change. Um, making sure that, you know, sliding scale fees and making sure that fixing your car is affordable. Um, and also as a customer of Good Vibes, I was reassured to hear that Hunter feels heard and listened to there. This is Sam Stagner, a server and a baker. And we talked a lot about how when workers speak up to make improvements in their workplace, how that additional labor goes uncompensated. And it's one thing to speak up about safety issues, but it's another thing to speak up in ways that are going to increase the profits of your workplace when you don't see those profits. So Sam um, talked a lot about not doing more than what's in the contract. And I thought that was kind of a cool way of resisting. Um, he does the job nothing extra and finds a lot of power in making that choice. Um, I'd like to note that yesterday was Workers Memorial Day and that is to honor people who died working. And you're in the deadliest state for workers in the United States. Workers die here at the highest rates. You're also in the state with the largest gender pay gap. So, I only did five interviews for this iteration, but I want to keep talking to people in Wyoming and address those two points. And I also want to say that through these interviews, I've learned that 
there are a lot of different ways that people find power in agency in their work. Resistance and resilience comes in all forms. And I think if there's sort of a certain kind of resistance that's put on a pedestal, that that can be discouraging. Um, you know, there is that power that Sam finds in just doing the bare minimum. Um, there's also power in staying silent until you can find a new job. And I just want to say thank you to the folks that were involved in this, um, to the Humanities Research Institute, to Anna for taking a lot of the photos, to the other folks in the cohort that labored through this, helped me think about it, um, the people I interviewed, the people who connected me with the people that I interviewed, um, my partner who cut out little pieces of paper to go in the jukebox. Thanks.